Okay, thanks. So I'm going to assume, unless somebody tells me that everyone can see and hear my slides, and there will be videos and stuff. So, um, and the transcript is now happening too. That's cool. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk today about, as you can see, face-to-face -face conversation with socially intelligent robots, and let's talk about what, why. Um, so face-to-face -face conversation is the thing that we're doing here today for the, you know. Something we didn't have a lot of in the last couple of years, but face to face conversation, physically embodied conversation. There's a whole lot more to conversation than just exchanging words or text or logical forms. There's the physical embodiment. When I talk, I don't just say words. I, there's my tone of voice. There is my facial expression. There's my gestures. All these things that I'm doing are kind of a big package of communication that I send to you guys that you guys send back to me. So face to face conversation, it's the basic form of human communication. It's also probably the richest form of human communication. And what I'm interested in doing in my research is trying to sort of take some level of that kind of, I don't like to use the word natural, but sort of smooth, using the same mechanisms people use to talk to each other and try to build robots that can engage in something like that sort of smooth communication with human partners. And so the question is why? Why, why would you want to build a robot that has a sort of social intelligence? And this is a video that went, the, um, went, went, went on YouTube a few years ago. Um, so what's going on in this video is this is a small toddler She's out for a walk with her parents, and by the side of the road is a water heater, which they put out to be collected as rubbish. And here's how she reacted to it. And I hope that everyone, both online and in the room, can hear the sound of this video because the sound is really cute and important. So that if you could if you couldn't see her here, somebody um, said so this is she, she basically saw this thing. She said it's a robot. Hi, robot. I love you, robot. This is kind of, you know, humans are inherently social. We sort of look for social interaction in anything you see, like Jesus in a, in a, in a piece of toast. You see sort of a, a, a piece of luggage that looks sad or a ha or happy HDMI cable or these are these are pictures from a Twitter account called Faces and Things, but humans are kind of hardwired in a sense to sort of try to socially interact with anything that looks like it even might be even slightly social. And obviously with a robot, humanoid or not, something that you can have a conversation with, people are going to try to have these sort of social converse, you know, use these sort of social signals on it, expect it to use social signals back. And this is also how robots work in pop, pop culture. So this is kind of this is a, this sort of video is cool. It's kind of a problem for people in this space, but this is what people think robots are like. So. So everyone involved in that scene was sending very, very clear social signals and eventually the robot managed to pick it up. But that's kind of how people imagine, you know, people imagine robots are these kind of shiny human things that can talk like a human and can recognize these very, very subtle social signals from the people they're talking to. Obviously, we're not there yet, but it's kind of this is what very small children think robots can do. This is what grown ups think robots can do, because this is how we imagine robots should be. So you put a robot out into the world, people kind of think you can do this kind of thing. So kind of the goal of my research is to try to sort of get somewhere close, you know, understand people's expectations, build something that's kind of close to what they want so that pe people can interact with it in sort of the way that, th that they want to. So I'm going to talk about a few projects in this space. This is one, the, this first one is one that I worked on a few years ago. This is, um, uh, so this, 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 unlike the other ones, is more of a lab-based study, but this was, a system I worked on where we tried to build a socially aware robot bartender. And if you, and bartending, obviously, on the one hand for robotics is really challenging in terms of grasping and pouring. That wasn't our goal. The goal here is actually thinking about bartending as an example of something where you need to manage a social scene. This is an example of many other places where a robot might be put, where it might be, for example, you need, it's a receptionist or anywhere where you have a bunch of people coming up and they all might need something from you and you got to figure out who needs what. And if you think about bartending in this sense, 
it's kind of a, there's two questions you need to answer is who of these people in front of me actually needs something from me and which of them can I ignore? And of the people in front of me, what, you know, the ones who do need something, what is it that they actually need? So I'll talk a little bit about how we address both of those questions. Um, and just to note that if you get this kind of managing the social scene wrong, you know, th this is an example, there's not a lot of actual pouring of drinks that happens in the scene, but this is really about managing the social situation. And I can just, I should just say this is a, this movie is PG-13 and the language gets slightly PG-13 towards the end of this clip. So um, just FYI, but here's an example of a bartender, a novice bartender not doing a very good job of managing the social scene in front of him. The lights, yeah. Can you turn up like those lights? Thanks. And obviously we didn't manage a situation like that, but that's just to sort of show the bartending. You can think of it as really an example of managing a social situation, trying to figure out what of all these people in front of me, how do I actually deal with this crowd of people in front of me? So what we did in this project was um, one of the first things we did was we looked into what signals do people use in a real bar to sort of show the bartender, hey, I actually want something. So this was uh, so what it turned out is that if you look at how do people try to get the attention of a bartender, at least in northern Germany, this might differ in other places, but we did this in Bielefeld. So this was recorded in some bars in Bielefeld. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, so what we found is that the main signal people used if they wanted to get the bartender's attention was they stood close to the bar and they directed their attention towards the bartender. And and you ask people what they might do, they would sort of say things like, well, I might wave, I might snap my fingers. That is incredibly rude to actually, people don't actually do that in practice. I think in a follow-up study, they had to pay people to violate social norms in that way. The, what, what you actually do is you just stand there and you kind of attend to the bartender. And if they don't notice you, you kind of reset and try to do it again. And so in this first picture, this guy, it's a bit hard to see, but this guy is close to the bar, but he's looking away. So he's not trying to get the bartender's attention. In this case, this person is looking at the bartender, but she's a bit further back. She's not trying to get the bartender's attention. But in this in these two pictures, this person is close to the bar and attending to the bartender. So they are trying to get the bartender's attention. And this turned out to be like 95% of the cases where they annotated people trying to get bartender's attention in a real bar. This is what they did. So we, so we, had to so we wanted to try to implement this in our system. But because we're computer scientists, we didn't, you know, the social psychologist, the psycholinguist told us, here's what people do, but we're like, we can't just sort of do that. We have to use machine learning. Um, so, so we tried a few different versions of how to automatically classify whether this person is actually trying to engage with the bartender. So we had a rule, like we tried to encode that rule that I said, basically, we define what does close mean? We define what does looking at the bartender mean? We set thresholds. We said, if, if it's above this threshold, then they're trying to get the bartender's attention. Or we tried to look at recordings from the actual, from, a, from the first version of the bartender system where we, where what the vision system basically gave us was right and left hand location, head pose, head orientation. So we could sort of tell how far are they from the bar and are they looking at the bartender or not and try to do a supervised learning uh, task on that. And we did a number of experiments on this. So it's a supervised learning task. So we did cross validation. Uh, uh, we did uh, an online user study. We sort of ran this online in the system. And we also did sort of, you know, testing, you know, we trained on one corpus and recorded some separate data and tried to test on this data that was recorded in a slightly different setting, which is kind of 
a bit more of it, a more of a test of it than just trying to cross validate. And we have a paper on this. And I, I, every time I present this, I have to say, yeah, you know, we, we did these experiments. We found out various number, various results in terms of, for example, the instance based classifier did amazingly on the cross validation, and really terrible on the brand new test corpus. Other, you know, other sort of rule based classifiers and rule learners. This is based on um, when we did this, we used the wet, uh, the wet uh, um, machine learning toolkit, and this is kind of from the kind of tutorial, these are a bunch of supervised classifiers that we just sort of chose based on they're the ones that are in the kind of the handbook as exemplary classifiers. Some of them did better, some of them did worse on, on cross validation, some of them did better, some of them did worse on the how on the freshly recorded test data. Um, but the main thing that we found here was actually if we just listened to the psychologists who told us what people do and tr instead of trying to reinvent it with supervised learning, we actually did better. Um, we did all this work to try to train these classifiers. And this is basically if we just say, here's what we mean by close, here's what we mean by attending to the bartender, then that actually does kind of OK on the um, on cross on the cross validation setting, but actually better than pretty much anything else on the new data. And so I think what was happening is all of our supervised classifiers were overtraining on the on the on the cross validation setting and yeah, basically listen to the psychologists when they tell you how people do something, they probably know what they're talking about to try to reinvent it with machine learning is my lesson from this. The, this last one was something we played around with because we realized we were classifying frame by frame and this is actually a temporal engagement is not something that changes frame by frame. It's actually a temporal um, state. So we tried using conditional random fields as well, which did which did be which did better than most of these kind of frame by frame classifiers, still not as well as the rules. So, so my, my ultimate lesson from this is this was a bunch of experiments. We learned a lot about engagement, but the main thing is if psychologists who are experts in human behavior tell you this is what humans do, maybe you should believe them instead of trying to reinvent it from first principles. So that's kind of my one one lesson I had from this. Conditional random fields. That's it. That's that's a all everything up to here is basically it classifies every frame independently. This one it classifies based on. I forget the details now. It's been a few years since I did this, but it's more of a temporal classifier. It doesn't just classify one frame at a time. It kind of looks at the the over time. So it so considering it as a temporal state as opposed to a frame by frame state is actually a better way to consider what we're actually trying to classify here. Because there's no point in noticing this person was unengaged for one frame. That's not actually a useful thing to do to respond to. You want to know what's what's their state if you if the system should respond to it. So that's in terms of one of one of the two bartending questions is here's a bunch of people, which of them should I actually pay attention to? Then the next question is now that I figured out here's a person who needs something from me, how do I figure out what it is they want? And in the bartending setting, what do they want is basic is really what drink do they want? And so we ran a whole series of evaluations of this system. Um, so the, the first version of the system we test, we uh, is basically does it work at all? The answer is pretty much yes, although the sensor sensors were problematic, so we had to sort of fix those. We ran a couple of other things comparing a purely task based interaction where the, the bartender would just basically say, here's the slots I need to fill, let me fill them versus one that actually had some idea of, of social norms in terms of you don't just sort of if somebody else walks up, you tell them maybe wait your turn and deal with the person who was already there and sort of just add some extra social behaviors to the purely task based version. We did find that things are more things kind of were more efficient with it with uh, the social behaviors. There were also some, but this study is hard to actually hard to interpret because we had some issues to do with demographics in terms of the population we were experimenting on where the demo, where the issue where. Frankly, the difference between Germans and non Germans was so big on this experiment that it kind of swamped any of the other data we want in the sense that we did a pretest post test subjective thing. And the Germans were just so negative on the pretest. That. Uh, Basic compared to everybody compared to everybody else, um, where the post test numbers were similar. We did look up, and it turns out that Germans, on some measure of, of, of optimism, were very near the bottom in terms of global measure of how optimistic are Germans. So I think they were actually. We asked them how good did they think it was going to be, and they said we think it's going to be not great, and everyone else thought it was going to be great, and then they sort of converged at the end. But it's kind of hard to. But it's hard to interpret this data completely because we had this unexpected confound in the demographics. I see there's at least a couple of Germans here who might agree with me about national characteristics about optimism in Germany. I don't know. Um, but we did but we did this experiment to compare these two different versions of the interaction. We also did another one where we compared either a hand coded version of the dialogue manager or one that was trained using reinforcement learning. And it turned out that the trained policy scored better scores, you know, did think a few things a little bit more smarter. 
than the hand-coded policy, and so it's ranked a bit higher. But these studies are all published, and you can look them up for details, but the point I'm trying to make here is actually not we did these studies, but we noticed when looking at all of these results is that we had made a mistake. We had made um, an error in how we encoded the system state in the sense that it ended up that if, if you just kind of made some noise, it would it would treat that as a speech recognition, speech recognition hypothesis and would serve you the drink. So we, we had a lot of, you know, we would serve drinks, but maybe not always the correct drink because we would have these situations where somebody, especially with the word Coke, you just sort of make some random noise. It would say, okay, here's your Coke, which is task success, success at some level, but not actually the drink you wanted. So for the final study, we actually went back to think about how are we representing the state that we're using to make decisions in this system. So for the first few years, for the first couple of years of the project, the state representation is what's in dark blue on this, which is basically there's a property and it's got a value. And we use the sensor data to sort of determine that value. And we use this, the values of these states to make decisions about what to do. And we realized we were throwing away a bunch of useful information from the sensors in terms of not just, you know, the ASR thinks this happened, but the ASR thinks this happened with this confidence, not the vision system thinks that they're, you believe something, but the vision system believes something with a certain level of confidence. So for the final version of the system, we added this extra data about the confidence for each attribute. So we, so we could, and that meant we could both include, we could have some indication about how certain we are about something. We could also include potentially multiple hypotheses if the ASR, for example, gave us two hypotheses and we weren't sure which one it was, we could actually include them both instead of having to say either we didn't understand or if it's above a threshold, OK, that was Coke. We could actually include things so we could sort of have a reason about uncertainty in the state. Um, so we did do an experiment involving this this model. Um, the one we didn't manage to. Um, we updated the state, I think, in a good way. We didn't actually have time to fully about update the dialogue manager. I mean, what happened was in practice, you would say, you know, I want a green lemonade. Do you, did you say green lemonade? Yes. Did you say green lemonade? Yes. Really green lemonade? Yes. Okay, here's your green lemonade. So we served the correct drink more frequently, but people's subjective scores went lower because we just hadn't quite calibrated the confirmation strategy right. But just to prove that this can work, um, so this is actually a, a participant in our experiment. This is not sort of a confederate. So this is how the, this is how this, you know, keeping uncertainty in the state and clarifying thing um, could work if it if it worked properly. So this is in German with English subtitles. Ah, where's my video? I like this video. There we go. Okay. So that was one where the state was it wasn't quite confident enough into what he'd said. So there was sort of, did you really say that? And then the mechanism would increase the confidence if he said yes, and then it'd say, okay, that's what I actually wanted to give you. So that's so that's it for um, James. That's a project that 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 happened a while ago. And as you can see, even in the final in the final experiments, it's all lab based. I never actually showed you a picture of this robot. It's um, I should put that back in the in the talk, but it's it's a little yellow cat head that that can talk. And then two big industrial arms of grippers. It was, yeah. Um, but so this, so this is this is really a lab-based type experiment. Everything else I'm going to talk about is getting out into the world, which is kind of where I think this field should really try to go: is move from the lab to actually doing experiments out in in the real world. And that's and that's the project I'm going to talk about now. And as 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 said in the introduction, this is a project, a European project that I coordinated, where our goal was to take a robot and put it into a shopping mall, specifically this robot in this shopping mall in Finland. Um, so you've probably all seen and heard about Pepper robots. And the goal was to put it in this in the in the sort of central atrium area of this shopping mall where it would sort of um, this is the info booth here, this little green box here. So there's usually a staff member there. This is where people can come if they want, if they need information about the mall in any sense, if they want to find out where the toilets are, any other information about the mall. And the idea was it would be um, deployed next to that info booth and answer questions from, from customers of the mall. So to design the behavior of this, we did a series of studies with, with um, the mall owners, with some, with some customers, with shop owners to sort of figure out what should this robot do. But I mean, they had some ideas in terms of it could be a security guard can carry your shopping, um, which were pr weren't practical with the specific robot that we actually were using. So it, it ended up doing the sort of thing that robots in these spaces usually do, which is kind of it would tell you it would tell you about the, uh, what's 
the, the events in the mall, it would give you guidance to shops. It could actually give you guidance. It could localize itself in the space. So it could give you guidance. It knew where it was in space. It knew where it had a map of the mall. So it, it, if it was giving you directions to a particular shop, it wouldn't just say it's down the corridor. It would actually turn and point and it could do perspective taking. So it knew what you could see. So that that was a big challenge as well was to 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 do that sort of perspective taking. Um, and one thing we did with this robot towards the end of the project is we actually put it into the mall for it ended up being 14 weeks, not not in the, in the sense that you did it depended all the time. It was only when we could actually be there to babysit it, but it was there for I think I've said um, uh, up to three days a week, three to five hours a day from September through this December 2019. So we were actually very lucky with our window on this in terms of when we were able to do this. A few months later, we wouldn't have been able to deploy, obviously. Um, so the, the robot was in the mall uh, on average about three days a week, three to five hours a day. And we did a few extra things in January as well. And I'm gonna talk a bit about how we actually um, did the deployment here because this was actually, if you look at this space and you think about the sensor, what, what this robot is gonna to need to be sensing, this is a giant, Echoey atrium with windows in the ceiling. So in terms of both vision and audio and, and, and ASR, you can imagine that's a really terrible environment for a robot to be in. So what we ended up doing was building this little home base. So what so this is kind of what the final deployment looked um, looked like. So this is um, first of all, we had to put vinyl on the floor because this is very shiny concrete that the peppers wheels couldn't move on. So we had to give it a floor that it could actually grip on. Um, this is an acoustic background, an acoustic sort of thing that would sort of help with the ASR. This is also a roof that has acoustic tiles, so that helps both with the speech recognition and also with controlling the light in this space because otherwise you have light coming in through the ceiling, which obviously makes the vision system have real difficulties. Um, so, and we had this was running on a laptop the system was running on a super duper chunky laptop with GPUs because we were doing vision connected to the robot with, with wired Ethernet. And then there was a local handler who would start and stop the robot. And we also had constantly had somebody on call remotely to start and reboot the components where necessary. And we had a lot of there's deployment for so we had to build so from April. So this deployment happened from um, September to December 2019. So from April, we had to start building this thing. We had to design the home base, how it would look like, um, how to set up the acoustic things. This is in Finland, where very few of our developers actually spoke Finnish, so we had to get everything translated into Finnish for deployment in that space as well. We also installed 3D flow cameras in the mall. Idiot, the mall is called Idia Park. So we installed those to sort of monitor people flow around there. And we also had to install markers so the robot could do the localization thing that we talked about, so it could know where it was, so we could use a 3D map to point appropriately. So we sort of essentially the, we ended up putting markers sort of there's kind of a balcony up here we would sort of put big sort of um, 2d barcodes into into the space around there so we could tell where it was um, there were uh, obviously doing this sort of deployment it produced a whole lot of unexpected complications this is one of my favorite emails from early in the deployment you can't read it but i'll zoom in on what the actual relevant thing was this was one day so this is the cabinet that that the robot was in, that the laptop was in. It has holes in it for ventilation because it was a big, giant, chunky laptop with a GPU that would get really hot. Um, it's fortunate that there were holes in this cabinet because this is the day that the person with the with the key to the cabinet didn't show up was was off sick. So this is an email trail that we had, and this is um, what somebody said. Basically, we all we had to do was turn on the laptop. Everything else could happen remotely, but somebody had to physically turn on the laptop. So this was basically we could try to switch on the computer through one of the holes of the cabinet with a long stick. Whoops, and they did, and it worked. But these, <laughs> this is a picture of you know that that they, they, that's basically I think a mop or something. They put it through one of the holes, managed to hit the power button of the laptop and turn it on, and we were able to deploy that day. So stuff you don't think of when you're deploying these things. I'm sure Mark and Francesco know lots of things about robot deployments, but these are things we didn't think of when we actually had to set this whole process up. But that was one of my favorite moments from the deployment. So what we actually ended up deploying, so we had on the system, we had audiovisual sensing. So you can probably see, I think you'll see in the video, we, we actually have, we have, we used a, a custom version of Pepper that had a, a different camera on it. We worked with SoftBank to actually develop a version of Pepper that had a better camera than just a built-in, you know, 640 by 480 webcam that's inside its head. 
Um, so we had so the system integrate uh, um, state of the art components for sensing the world, sort of figuring out how many people are there, detecting their state, social social system processing, turning that into figure out who's there, what do they want, interaction management in terms of the the, the dialogue management. If this would interact in speech, using it had a bunch of uh, an array of different chatbots it could it could use in terms of social chats and um, information about the mall and navigation. And this perspective taking and navigation was a whole um, work package in itself in this project. So it would do, it would chat about things. It could give you a quiz about them all if you wanted. It could do route descri description only in dialogue, or if we had somebody on site who was able to help with the, with the localization, we could it could do route description with dialogue and sort of situated pointing. And that's kind of especially what the January deployment was. We had some people from that from the group that had done the the, the um, perspective taking work to actually be in the space to help to run this version of the system. And we have a paper describing the technical versions of the technical details of this system. So this is Mary Ellen Foster et al. And when I say et al, this is what et al is. This was a huge project involving a huge number of people from a bunch of different sites. This was a really big effort to get this robot deployed. Um, so this, this, these are the actual authors on, on that Foster et al paper. There's probably about 20 of us there. Um, and here's an example of what interacting with the deployed system was like. It's it's in, this time it's in Finnish, but again with English subtitles, so you can sort of get a sense of how this thing worked. Come on back. ASR is not great. <laughs> Social chat. Yeah, I understand So this is perspective taking. It knows where you are. It knows where things are. Trying. I'll talk in a second what's happening here now. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that little incident at the end was something I'm going to talk about in a second in terms of. <laughs> so, so in the in the end, yeah. Um, I was I was chatting with Mark about this before. It kind of feels like we sometimes put robots into places where they'll let us put robots, as opposed to put robots into places where they're actually useful to be robots like that was if you want to if you actually want to find out where the shoemaker was you would not ask this robot you would ask the human who's in the booth next to the robot but it was kind of it was it was a fun thing for people to talk to still so we had 40 to 100 encounters per day at least half of them were with a child sometimes we would have a family where the family would come up and they would push the child forward you talk to the robot the, the parents would sort of hang back it was an interesting sort of social situation that would happen in that space um we so this this required a whole lot of babysitting so we, we could never let this run autonomously there was always somebody on call to at the start to basically reboot components at the end the the, the, the messages we were getting at the start were like it crashed again the messages we were getting at the end on slack were more like it said something weird as opposed to the robot stopped responding so it got to the point where it was problems with the, the things it would say as opposed to the problems with it not saying anything at all but we learned a lot of lessons from this um so because there was no on-site expert, so it was more important to get robust you know, robust behavior that would actually work as opposed to trying to get, there's a version of the system that we could run. People were testing in their own labs. It's much more um, full featured, especially the, like the dialogue. This, this was a very, very cut down version of a very, very fancy and full featured dialogue system, but we just couldn't put most of that conversation in partly because of the, because of the deployment context, partly because it had to speak Finnish. Like there, there's a very, very full featured English version of this system, which we couldn't deploy. And there's an issue as well in terms of 
especially in Finland, the data protection laws are very, very tight, tighter, I think, even than other EU countries. So we we have all these logs. We don't have a whole lot of um, and now, you know, figuring out what actually happened. We weren't able to record as much as we, we would have wanted of these sort of people, members of the public. Sometimes people would specifically give us permission to record them. But in general, it was difficult. Um, we had to set up this whole home base for the robots, um, which we hadn't, which we'd sort of hope we wouldn't have to do um, in the propo uh, proposal time. But it turned out Pepper in a, in a two story atrium with with windows in the ceiling cannot exist at all. If you're going to do that, it has to be in this little box. Um, we also hadn't fully thought about the issue of that we were doing this in Finland. Um, so we had to do a whole lot of manual translation effort to make this work throughout the deployment. Even like, like I said, the later messages were like, you know, after we got through the basic technical, it's not working at all issues. It was kind of like that. It said something really weird. We need to fix what it says in this in this situation in Finnish. And the last thing, this these four are kind of more technical kind of you know, lessons learned for any deployment. Uh, this is something we hadn't really realized until we sort of put this out there. The chatbot this was based on was something that was originally developed for this an Amazon Alexa challenge um, by, by, by colleagues at Harriet Watt. And the point of the original version of the chatbot was, it was kind of a competition where you wanted people to chat with their Alexa and one of the criteria was, is the conversation very long? Like you, you could, you could, you would do well if people were engaged in it for longer. And what that means in practice is this chatbot is very good at engaging people and very bad at disengaging people. Like people you saw even in that video with that was kind of a semi-confederate. Um, she was trying to walk away and the robot's like, hey, how was your weekend? It's like, no, I'm trying to leave now. And so she still walked away. We had sort of older people who would engage in a conversation with the robot and would clearly want to leave, but the robot kept asking them questions and they just didn't feel like they could be rude enough to leave. So engagement is not a problem. Um, disengagement. We hadn't. We 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 need to think more clearly about how do you let people get out of the conversation, and, and, and don't just kind of keep trying to ask them questions. So th so this this deployment all happened in 2019. The project finished in 2020. Um, unfortunately, because of th other things that happened in 2020, we've not managed to write up the results of this deployment yet. We're still working on that. I mean, because we have a whole bunch of data, we have a whole bunch of recordings. We have all, you know, as I said, this was kind of. 40 to 100 interactions a day for, you know, 14 weeks, three days a week. We have a whole lot of interactions. We have a whole lot of interesting data to try to analyze, but we haven't managed to write this up yet, but we're hoping to get something um, written up soon. It's just because of 2020, things haven't actually happened just yet, but that's still the plan. Um, so I'm gonna talk now about stuff. That, so those are two projects that were finished. I'm going to talk now about stuff that I'm working on right now. And the first is this um, Canada UK joint project about using AI enhanced social robots to improve children's healthcare experiences. So this is a very different sort of deployment and this is com you know almost completely not language based. Like the first two I talked about, there was a lot of conversation. This is about social interaction but really not a whole lot of conversation. Um and first of all I just want to say this project we're still trying to come up with a shorter name for it. Like this is the actual name of the grant. We haven't, I keep trying to think of names for it. The only thing name I, could, I keep thinking of is pain bot, which is not really the right sort of thing you want that's got kind of the wrong connotations. I want something that's kind of got more positive connotations. We're hoping to come up with a shorter version of this project name, but at the moment it's only got this big long noun phrase. Um, but what this project is, um, so the easiest way to describe the project is to sort of break down this project name. So children experience painful and distressing things in the emergency department all the time, sort of unavoidably. If they come in, they've got it, you know, they've got to do tests, they've got to sort of attach things to them, and you can't avoid that. And but but if you don't address the pain and distress, then you can have negative consequences for that, sort of both sort of short term in terms of you can't actually do the tests you want or get the medication you want into the kid, but also long term in terms of you could have the kids can develop needle phobia or things like that. So it so you really need to sort of try to address the pain and distress that children feel in a healthcare setting. And people have played around with various technologies in this space. Um, there's been research on using sort of books and games and VR and smartphone apps. And, and some people have even experimented with using social robots in this context. But most of the social robots, and it sort of seems like social robots are one possible, you know, there's been promising indications of using a robot in this space. But most of the robots people have used in this context have been 
uh, pretty much fully teleoperated. They're, they're just puppets. There's sort of a, a research assistant kind of hitting next, 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 next on a tablet, but there's no kind of, there's no autonomy, there's no adaptiveness in how the robots behave. So the goal of this project is to add some level of autonomy to this, to this use case, to try to add some level of sort of sensing the scene and some models of adaptation so that the robot can, instead of it having to be completely wizarded or just completely scripted even, the system can do some actual intelligent adaptation to the situation and maybe change its behaviors depending on what's happening in the room. And then obviously we want to use that to try to sort of improve the experience of, of children in this space. And on the project, so the system, we're collaborating with some medical researchers in Canada, and the goal is eventually sort of later this year to, to actually try to prove that this actually works through a clinical trial. So we're actually working, we're going to actually deploy this in two pediatric emergency departments and compare reported pain and distress um, to in sort of what when they do their standard thing to situations where the robot is present. So it's not so this is this is a different type of evaluation than the stuff I've worked on in any project before, where it's kind of like either do people not hate it in the world or can undergrads interact with it? This is kind of actually full on clinical trial with actual children where this could actually make a real difference to their well-being. So a um, bit of pressure on the evaluation, but it's also very exciting to have this as a use case. Um, so we have obviously designing the behavior of this robot. We we in so essentially the UK team on this project has been doing the AI doing and the robotics and the medical expertise is all in Canada. So obviously this is we need to get input from those clinical partners in terms of what should this robot actually do. So we have a paper NHRI coming up um, in a month and a half about the co-design efforts that we did on this robot together with the clinical partners. And so here's a video that sort of explains how that co-design process went. Um, we had to make this video for, for, for HRI, so I figured I could show it here too. Sorry, it's a little loud. This is the actual. So this is the needle part that goes into the skin, and we leave just this soft little straw in the veins. So, so that's so that's kind of a, a summary. We have more details in the paper about the whole co-design process. This has been an ongoing pro. It took a lot longer than we thought, but I think we've come up with something, so something pretty good now in the sense that the system has now been built based on consultation with healthcare providers, parents, and children in terms of what should the robot do, what role should the robot take at different phases. So there's the pre-procedure phase, there's the actual procedure phase. While, while they're actually doing the IV insertion, and there's kind of the debriefing after the after the after that. And so together with the healthcare providers, we came up with sort of different behaviors that the robot should do in each of those in each of those contexts and how it should choose between different behaviors. Always happens. Um, in terms of the system we've built, um, so it, this in this case we're using a now robot um, and with an external camera. Uh, and 
the, the system itself is is running on a Raspberry Pi and a Jetson. So Raspberry Pi for sort of the main kind of uh, action selection. We're also using a Jetson because we're using vision, um, using this um, fairly nice stereo camera. So the the so deployment scenario we'd imagine would be sort of the, the child is in a clinical bed, the parent normally the parent will be sitting sort of like here. Then this the now and the camera will be on a trolley which will be sort of rolled in, and 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 deployed in that corner. So this this is what the system kind of looks like in terms of system components. We're doing um, you know th this we're doing we can't really do much on the speech recognition side. We we will we are considering adding just a tiny bit of speech recognition. Um, using uh, offline ASR, we because we can. One of the constraint, one of the hard constraints on the system is we cannot rely on there being internet available because we're going to be in the hospital. Um, so we have to do everything kind of locally. So we thought we couldn't use ASR at all, but it turns out that OpenAI came up with a ASR model late last year that actually can run without the internet. So we're integrating that, but there's still not going to be a whole. We're still going to be trying to do ultimately speech recognition on children in a distressing situation, distressing noisy situation. So we can't rely on there being an actual conversation, but we can probably ask them like yes, no questions or things like that. But in terms of the system behavior, there's so we're doing we are doing some face tracking and that's going to be sort of looking at where is the child attending and how, that's you know, there's an indication of what are they attending to and there's also an indication of how much are they moving around, which is kind of a proxy for how are they feeling? How much distress are they feeling? So we turn that into a social state. We have an interaction manager. We also, because we, we, we're we pretty sure we can't sense everything, we're going to have a GUI for people to sort of scaffold the sensors to sort of say, by the way, you know, this is, you know, maybe you should stop now or the child's getting distressed even if you can't detect it. And then we produce output. And the, the actual um, action selection is done based on an AI planner. So these are some, so the so we have a planning domain and it's, a, it's an epistemic planner, which means it can, it can use sensing actions to sort of query the state of the world. So these are some plans that, that so this is not a script. This is the output of the planner for different situations, depending on what the sense state is. And I realize I've got to move. Um, so that's that's a project where, where we're at right now is the system is basically working, but and we are just in the process of, in the UK in our lab, and we're just in the process of getting it, uh, getting the clinical partners in Canada to get the system up and running so they can start testing it because we want to start putting it in the emergency department in sort of a test mode quite soon, and hopefully hopefully with the aim of doing a clinical trial in the second half of this year. Um, one other project that's even in a, an earlier stage is we're also uh, I'm also just starting to look at the role of accents in HRI and not and this is not so much to do with speech recognition but also to do with text to speech. So I'm working with a psycho with a sociolinguist who's interested in accent bias, especially with UK accents. And so our eventual goal is to try to experiment with um, changing the accent that a robot speaks with. To maybe match the regional accent of where it's deployed. Sort of as a first step for this, we actually carried out an, an online survey of Scottish adults to ask about their expectations of interacting with HRI. And obviously, as you know, um, Scottish accent is sort of notoriously difficult for automated systems to interact with. And I just want to show this video because it's fun. You many of you have probably seen this video before. If not, okay. Again, the language gets a little spicy towards the end again, but it. It's worth it, I think, in terms of th this is fictional, but this gives an idea of, of how regional accents can interact with sort of um, embodied agents. No, they don't do Scottish accents. Eleven. Could you please repeat that? Eleven. 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 Could you please repeat that? Eleven. Who's that gives us? You need to try an American accent. Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. That seems Irish. Eleven. 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 Eleven.
<laughs> Eleven. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat that? Eleven. If you don't understand a lingo, I'll be back to you in your own country. Ooh. What's that talking about? Is it way back to your own country? Oh, don't start, Mr. Bleeding Heart. How can you be racist with a lift? Please speak slowly and clearly. Eleven. 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 Does he say it the same way? What do you say? It's all in the Scottish way. Eleven. 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 What do you say? Tell me what you're talking about. Please state which floor you would like to go to in clear and calm manner. Calm. Calm. There's a concept twice to tell people to be calm. Because it's weird to be saying this Scottish people who be going up for months. You have not selected a floor. If you would like to get out of the elevator without selecting a floor, simply say, open the doors, please. Please, please. Suck my wall, yeah. I don't want you to sit down, sir. On the way, not for nothing. <laughs> people actually said on our survey as well. So there's, I mean, there's details in the paper and, and graphs and charts and so on. But in general, there was kind of an asymmetry that people, these these Scottish, these mostly Scottish people sort of thought they expected to be able to understand the robot, but they assumed the robot might have difficulty understanding them. So there's one one quote from one of our participants describing an experience that she previously had with a sat nav, um, which kind of sounds like the real world version of basically what that, that skit I just showed. So so our goal with this project, we're just developing this. We've got a PhD student who's just starting on this and we're writing a proposal in this space. We're looking at what happens if you actually change the voice that a robot talks with? How do people respond to a robot that actually uses a regional accent? Is it disconcerting? Does that engage people more? So we're going to play around with this. This is the, so, so watch this space. Um, right now we've just done this survey, but we're working on this project. And so I, I realize my time's short. I just want to talk just a little bit about, um, I've been talking all about, you know, why should we want to build these socially intelligent robots? Because, you know, all if you manage to make these robots that are socially intelligent, people can interact with that are persuasive in various ways. Of course, you can use this for good or for evil. And so there's been, this is just a couple papers that I that have looked at this. Many people have in terms of robot, people will trust robots, you know, even even with no, without a whole lot of social intelligence, just the fact that a robot tells you to do something, people will very often do it, even if you shouldn't. So this is a paper where people, it allowed, you know, for example, Pepper allowed people to tailgate them into a secure area, or the robot was just chatting to somebody and people spontaneously elicited sort of sensitive information to a robot, or a robot instructed users to carry out tasks like inserting USB sticks into computers where they shouldn't and people would follow the instructions. This is a really disturbing one um, where the, the, in, in VR, but it was still a robot, where the robot would give people clearly bad instructions in a simulated emergency thing where it's like there's a fire or an active shooter and the robot actually tells you you should go through there. And people would follow the robot's instructions, even in this very, you know, so, so you, I mean, this is just, people are just sort of starting to think about this. I mean, we're not at the point where um, the robots are C-3PO yet, but you could imagine sort of a robot with social intelligence. Um, this is, I'll just finish with this video. If you have a robot that is socially intelligent and can, you know, produce social signals that give, make you feel a certain way, obviously there are things you could do with that that are not necessarily positive. So this is, um, a this is a show called The Good Place. There's a character on that called Janet. If you've not seen it, all you need to know is that she is an artificial character. Um, and for 
plot related reasons, these two have decided that she needs to be switched off. So that's all you need to know to understand this video. yet but this is something to start you know all these sort of socially intelligent robots that can interact with people in a natural way you could imagine companies wanting to use that for evil as opposed to for good so it's a thing to you know i don't have an answer but that's the thing to think about so just to finish off quickly i realize my time's just sped up just humans are inherently social they want to interact with everything sort of small children you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll interact with robots pop culture makes us believe robots are shiny humans we can interact with the way we interact with other people. So we need to take that into, into account when we're putting robots into the world. So we have to detect those social signals and respond appropriately, where appropriate is not, we have to decide what appropriate means for a particular robot in a particular use case. Stuff I've been talking about, so I talked about the James Project, which is one from a while ago where we did this in a lab. And then I've talked about more recent things um, where we're trying to do this in the world. And then obviously, what if, what if my research program actually succeeds? Obviously, we need, I'm starting to think about like, what are the right and wrong ways to actually use this kind of socially intelligent robots? And so obviously acknowledgements. So not, not only does this project need a better, better name, it also needs a better website. We're working on that this year. But this is, you know, huge numbers of people that have collaborated with on these various projects. And that's it for this. Thanks very much. Any questions? So in the first project, you mentioned many times the word dialogue 